one of Spain's faces, Andalusian fishermen, old as the Phoenicians. One half the yield of a grudging sea for the fishing master, one half for the crew. And days when there is no fishing at all. To the north, in the Basque country, a new face of Spain, mirrored in chrome steel, with a new automated look. The face of Estremadura, the Spanish southwest, and water flowing toward the eager land. Endless and ageless olive groves, marching off in a million columns to wage the struggle for food, fuel, and fertilizer. The resigned face of antiquity, where joy and security have vied with sorrow and despair and made their peace. and the varied aspects of the church. El Greco saw this sol y sombra, the sunlight and shadow, and put it to canvas. Toledo's silhouette climbing on blocks of black and white up to the Alcazar. In bas relief against the earth and sky of old Castile. This is one of the ten principal parts of modern Spain. Ten old kingdoms and principalities, steeped in ancient jealousies and hostilities, separated by mountain barriers, languages, customs, and derivation. Held uneasily together by force, by grudging convenience, and the sobering fact that there's nowhere else to go. The Romans, proprietors and city builders of this peninsula, observed that it lay in the shape and texture and color of an oxhide, drying and bleaching in the Iberian sun. And so it hangs, rigidly impaled from southern Europe, neither of nor in Europe, but in proximity, just Spain. In 1588, staking all on a single throw, Spaniards sailed with 3,165 guns on 132 ships to chastise the English upstart. The Armada's wreckage littered the seafloor and channel beaches, washed up as prize of war, the mastery of three continents, Europe and two Americas. Then, north of the Pyrenees, Europe engaged in revolutions, fought, conquered, lost, beheaded kings, founded new empires, and exploded with new ideas and heresies. Wars, some European and some worldwide, thundered and blazed beyond Spain's frontiers. The Spaniard, watched the dissolution of his empire, dreamt of gold and the good life. He borrowed ideas, contemplated new dogmas, joined imported groups and movements, invented some of his own, but played a passive role in Europe. Then, in 1936, 300 years of collected rivalries and old stirrings exploded all at once, and Spain bled. Down the road from Madrid came the Loyalist army, peasants, laborers, intellectuals, and soldiers to seize Toledo from Colonel Moscardo and his rebel garrison. They paused above the deep-gorged river, looping like a moat around the mountain citadel. Then they went into the river and into the barrage. They died in the cool water. More died on the opposite bank, and still more on the walls, the roofs, and in the narrow streets. Door by door, roof by roof, wall by wall, the rebel defenders fell back and upward to the Alcázar. Both sides executed their prisoners and political opponents. For 80 days, the Alcázar withstood bombardment, siege, and dynamiting from tunnels dug beneath it. Then up from Andalusia came the rebel army to rescue the Alcázar garrison. In the river, in doorways, on rooftops and ledges of wall, the dying was repeated. The siege was broken, and it's said that loyalist blood ran out of the little plazas of execution, down the gutters, and into the river. The scars have not gone away. 
The Alcantar is being rebuilt over the years into a Civil War memorial, lest future generations forget. This generation will never forget. When the siege was at its height, the son of Colonel Moscardo was captured and brought to a telephone in the city. The loyalist commander ordered Moscardo to surrender the Alcathar, else his son would die. The father's pleas were in vain, and from this room and over this instrument, the farewells were spoken, and the boy was told to commend his soul to God and die for Spain. He did. The shots heard through the receiver announced execution of the threat. Much of Spain says this was the cost of rescuing the country from communism. Proof is wanting, but so is disproof. It was also the cost of saving Spaniards from themselves and prompted the sternest edict of the Franco regime. No Spaniard shall lay hand upon another. That civil war, resolving such uncertain issues at such frightful cost, has seared the national conscience, left homes and hearts with dark memories and darker vows. It accounts for some of the singular uniqueness of this sometimes noble, frequently inexplicable, not easy to manage Spaniard. Partially sealed off in his own peninsula, removed from 350 years of outside shock and crisis, he is compensated with an unconscious cultivation of his own character and personality. He has developed a particularity. The Spaniard invites you to define him, if you must, as he teeters somewhere between 1588 in 1961. I am very pessimistic about the outlook of people when they think of other countries. In America, most of the ideas about Spain are very limited. In Madrid lives Dr. Julian Marius, writer, teacher, philosopher, with sufficient intellectual power and prestige that he can sometimes exercise a prerogative limited only to the few like him, criticize the regime. But we sought him because he knows his fellow Spaniard, and this is one of the things he told us. The average American believes that Spain is a Latin country, that it is, of course, in the southern part of Europe, that there is sunshine, bullfights, that we had or we still have something to do with the Arabs, that we had a civil war 20 years ago, and that its sequels still prevail. Many Europeans think of the United States as if prohibition was still present. Americans think of Spain in terms of 1939. I would say in terms of Marxism versus fascism. But you know, it is hard after all to freeze a country. There have been quite a few changes. Barcelona, the nation's best seaport. A gay blade, contemptuous of Spain's old world shyness. Pushing her toward intimacy with such rakish newcomers as foreign investments, industry, mass production and technology. Trying to turn her head and cause her to forsake her old agrarian hand hewn economy. The Spanish worker is quick and eager. Last year, some 35,000 were recruited for short term contracts in West European factories and mines. The government has made a modest beginning in technological education and training. Some economists say Spain would have been better advised to put this investment into basic industries instead of consumer goods. Spain makes about 40,000 cars a year, but only about 2,000 tractors. Barcelona exudes pace and purpose. It seems to know where it's going. When Spain comes clanging and honking into the age of technology, Barcelona will lead the way. Madrid is something else. Historically the home of the arrogant Castilian, general manager and self-appointed ruler of Spain. There's an aimlessness in Madrid, a preoccupation with trivia. Without politics, debate, criticism, or free comment, there is little else to do. Pursuit of the good life, of leisure, of the heart, good wine and good food, mistresses and courtesans, and a job in the government providing a style to which the Spaniard can quickly grow accustomed. This golden moment may never be recaptured. Duane is for the children, servants for Senora. 
labor is the cheap commodity in Spain. But there's an absence of class distinction. Some simply work for others, and with a little luck, others may one day work for them. When a Spaniard has made his economic mark, he's not inclined to reinvest or expand. He leaves his farm or factory in the care of someone else and moves into a new Madrid apartment. He invests in pleasure. Madrid's architecture ranges the phases of Spanish history and the spectrum of taste. The dreaded Puerta del Sol prison in the heart of town, currently familiar to an asserted 6,000 political prisoners. The post office. Government and its plethora of bureaus is another lethargic influence. After 25 years, the ministries have not yet completed their own offices. And the economy is looking up. Spain will have almost a billion dollars worth of gold reserves by the end of the year. Most of it from tourism. There is change in the air. The old restaurants catering exclusively to writers or philosophers, journalists or bullfighters are gone, replaced by modern cafes or by a Madrid specialty, the fish bar. Spain's consumption of shellfish is prodigious. If you're squeamish about throwing the shells on the floor, the waiter does it for you with a flourish and characteristic lack of discipline and contempt for rules. and the faces of loneliness or isolation, extremism of emotion, vitality and passion, individualism that precludes compromise or cooperation, and the need for external discipline by state and church. In Spain, it is always more important what is said than what is done. Words, 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 we always live on them. Carthage, Greece, Rome, of the Goths, Moors, and Iberians. Faces with fleeting admission of austerity and sensuality, explosive enthusiasm and racking discouragement, cruelty and courtesy. Isabel has broken much of her association with Spain's recent past putting behind her the protective custody of parents and duena and village church to work in the city. She is no stranger to loneliness or the distractions of the capital. But her few possessions are her own and she is part of Spain's search for something new and better. Not long ago, this would have been unthinkable. A respectable girl did not work and certainly did not live away from her family.
Spanish youth demonstrates, criticizes, or attends a political meeting at the risk of its physical freedom, but its rebellion is authentic and significant. Galerias Preciados is Madrid's newest and largest department store. Isabel works here for $10 a week, selling merchandise far beyond her meager wage. There's an Isabel for every customer, and more back in the villages. A supermarket in Madrid is a daring challenge to the old tradition of small shops or vendor stalls, limited inventory, minimum choice for the consumer, and the soft sell of short supply. Spain's traditional system of marketing and commerce is threatened for the first time. Innovations like this could ease Spain's surplus of farm labor. Another new phase of Spain is mobility. Over the worn and rickety rail system and the rudimentary roads, Spaniards are coming to the city. They are less inclined to endure stoically the poverty of farm labor. For the quick and the fortunate, there are opportunities in the city. Movement may ultimately end the regionalism, separatism, and old provincial loyalties. Spain, to be sure, has slums, and many of the adventurers from the country will populate them. As slums go, they're no worse than those of an American city, not as bad as the ones in Latin America. Spain's poverty, while genuine, is not quite the oppressive, grinding variety either. Perhaps because fish, olive oil, bread, wine, and some vegetables are cheap. The fortunate and the resourceful will one day move out of the slums and into new housing developments. Economists frequently deplore Franco's investment of American aid in housing instead of basic productive machinery and equipment. But whatever the rationale, there is change television antennas, 100% increase in telephones in seven years, car ownership tripled in 10, and mile after mile of new housing developments in the principal cities. Diversions constitute Spain's classic face. Wild, violent, passionate, proud, and cruel. 
undisciplined within disciplined form, characteristic obsession with the tragedy of death. The bull ring attracts fewer Spaniards than soccer, but they see some of themselves at the Corrida.
tragedy is played out to its certain and predictable climax. The Spaniard says there is beauty in death in the afternoon. It's either an incredible subtlety or a rationalization, or it is also the killing of a bull. Sometimes we speak of lands without winter, thinking of the tropical countries. Some people believe that Spain is something more surprising, a land without a future. But life goes on. The trouble is that for more than 20 years, no vital present issues have been discussed. There is no politics. And instead... Viso is one of Spain's myriad villages. Two peasant brothers live with a widowed mother. In addition to a state social security program, Spaniards stoutly maintain their traditional system, in which each individual will probably provide a home at some time or another for a relative. They stream down the road each morning at sunrise to the shape up at 90 cents a day. Most of them will find work, for labor is sufficiently cheap that the point of diminishing return is uncertain. days and weeks of no work later, just the passage of time in the time oblivious village. These are part of the landless labor force. One half of Spain's manpower works at the land, but it produces only a quarter of the country's income. With water, technology, and land redistribution, 40% of the labor force could be surplus, available for other work. Spain lags behind even Greece, Egypt, and southern Rhodesia in per capita consumption of food energy. One reason is the latifundia, the big estates, cultivated whimsically. There are 17 million acres of these, divided among 10,000 owners, one-third the irrigable land. The owners live in the cities, pursuing each golden moment. Their land is reserved for the breeding of bulls, devoted to pasture and hunting, are cultivated as infrequently as one year out of five when the owner can be persuaded to put aside for a few weeks the pleasure of the city. Sometimes the land is leased to sharecropper peasants for usurious shares of the crop. Here lay one of the principal causes of the Civil War, 
for the Republican government had moved to break up the Latifundia. The landowners supported the rebellion. Peasants returning to the village, silhouetted against the setting sun, is a feature of classically romantic and picturesque Spain, which is marked for oblivion when the new age takes over. It was 1951 before Spain's economy began to recover from the Civil War, in which, incidentally, her entire treasury of gold had been shipped off to Moscow and where it has disappeared. In 1951, with American aid, the government, admittedly 25 years late, moved men and mules to harness the few rivers which flow through the country. Only about 40% of Spain's land can be cultivated. Only one acre in 12 is under irrigation. If every river is completely harnessed, a project scheduled for 1972, the irrigated land will total about 15%. In addition to irrigation, Spain must bring technology, tractors, and fertilizer to the land. It cannot delay much longer a land redistribution to utilize the latifundia. It should give up entirely the growing of wheat, which yields less in Spain than anywhere else in Europe. In the lush orange-scented land near Valencia lies another village with the pleasant name of Cullera, and the pleasant countenance of well-being that comes from peasant citizens who own their land. The latifundias in this region were broken up. This farmer owns about 25 acres a pleasant house with electricity and running water, and a secure future. His daughter will not go to the fields at sunrise. She will go to school, to church, to the village festivals. When she marries, her father will spend a small fortune for her gown and the wedding party. But unlike other peasants, he won't go in debt for it. A farm worker here makes three times the wage of other areas. And in the evening, the villagers will stroll out to their pleasant countryside or admire the prospect of their homes from the hilltop where the church boasts a lighted cross. This is a farm worker who, like many of the men of the village, has managed to purchase a plot of his own. He works on the big farms or in the orange groves during the week, tills his own five acres in the evening and on Sundays. His son says he's not going to be a farmer, perhaps a scientist or a doctor. Three generations. The Spaniard's house, like the Spaniard, turns away from the outside and faces inwardly upon itself. Each Spaniard has his heart and his conscience. Each house has its courtyard. This farmer has farm tools, a motorbike for holidays. His son has a new bicycle and the baby a new stroller. The only entrance to the courtyard is through the house. He'll spend a portion of this Sunday cultivating his own tomato crop while the family goes to mass. In the afternoon, he may take the family on the motorbike to the countryside, stopping at a cafe for beer, a sandwich, and talk.
irrigated Valencia area, Spain's vigorous appetite for rice is almost satisfied. This is a healthy agricultural area, where farm labor is comparatively well paid, where the big estates have been redistributed, where a peasant has a chance to own some land, where water and technology have been applied to the soil. Spain is totally Roman Catholic. A couple synagogues are tolerated, but otherwise no non-Catholic faith is permitted any sort of public display or ceremony. In the small towns and villages, in the parishes of the poor or the plain, the church is at its best. It is enduring and omnipresent, in sickness and in health, in life's small matters. It is present at birth, and it may have encouraged in some way the Spaniard's insistence that he must die gloriously or with significance. The church is part of life and part of the nation, the streets, the land, the government. Candy for the children at baptism, a parade for confirmation, a fiesta for the wedding, public mourning for the dead, and mass for ceremonies of state. The church ranges from powerful political partner of the government, owner of land and shaper of national policy, to dispenser of solace and humble comforter of the Spanish spirit. Spain's most influential churchman is Enrique Cardinal Pla y Daniel of Toledo. He has sternly criticized the Franco regime, called for liberalization and easing of censorship. Military officers and Falanque leaders seek his blessing. Holy Week in Sevilla is the most extravagant spectacle of the Roman Catholic world. Each parish parades through the city streets and plazas its religious float encrusted with generations of gold and silver leaf and precious stones. The figures are stark and sensual. Penitentes will follow the floats, some in search of forgiveness, some in search of status, or in pursuit of custom. Bearers can carry the gold and silver burden only a few feet at a time. The spectator volunteers the wild song of the Saeta, 
rich with the cry of the Moors and the love song to the Virgin. and demonstrations choke Sevilla's narrow streets each night of Holy Week, mounting in splendor toward Saturday night mass in the great cathedral, its altar gleaming with the riches of Spain's one-time golden Americas. I think that the difference between the United States and Spain is mainly the way we, we project. The American projects to medium distances, a year, two years, a contract, a job, a wedding. We project to extreme distances. We Spaniards project for this afternoon or for our whole life. The Maya Festival of Valencia is an annual celebration in honor of St. Joseph with only faint religious meaning. All year long, the sections of the city collect money for the construction of paper mache statues. Some are socially or politically satirical, but never of domestic Spanish politics. circus it's called. Subtitle, The World Band of Troublemakers. Playing the last number. Khrushchev beating the drum with his shoe. Kennedy playing the triangle. Castro the cymbal. And De Gaulle the trombone. On the climactic night of the festival with characteristic Spanish extravagance. The fires are strung with fireworks and put to the torch. Flames leap from every plaza and the city shudders to the bombardment.
from the dying ashes trails a wisp of Spain. Tomorrow, they begin collecting centavos and pesetas for bigger fires next year. Today, the reluctant Spaniard ventures, hesitant and unsure, toward the space and nuclear age of the outside world. But what of his government, of which there is considerable? It fails to explain the Spaniard. Perhaps he explains it. The rule is authoritarian, out of and beyond our comprehension. Paternal, omnipresent, harsh, but only when you cross it. The Spaniard admits to little talent for governing himself. But the sharpest critic of the stultification, the endless bureaus, the permits, the functionaries, the questions and delay, is quick to challenge the visitor's complaint. For criticism is exclusive privilege of his own, not for the stranger. He mistrusts American pension for idealization. And he guesses that Franco is what Spain has needed. That pointing to his quarter century of peace, he could win any election in any given week. At least the Spaniard says it over and over, hoping perhaps to convince himself while convincing others. Speaking of Primo de Rivera, an earlier Spanish dictator, Julian Marias again. Primo de Rivera was a liberal at heart. Many middle-aged liberals miss him a lot now. He did quite a few things, quite a few good things, I mean. But instead of leading in time, he made the usual mistake of dictators. He stayed and stayed and stayed. Among these 30 million handsome, lovely, and generous people, with the sun shining and the laughter quick and easy, all the mutually hostile groups are waiting in the wings, with no chance to talk out their animosity or dissolve in rational debate the dogmatic fangs of old hostilities, all aware of the inexorable actuary table as it applies to Francisco Franco. Monarchists, Republicans, syndicalists, and separatists, socialists, phalanchists, anarchists, and church. And for Moscow's furtive disciples, a favorable climate of back rooms and dark cellars. exploded all at once, and Spain bled. Down the road from Madrid came the Loyalist Army, peasants, laborers, intellectuals, and soldiers, to seize Toledo from Colonel Moscardo and his rebel garrison. They paused above the deep-gorged river, looping like a moat around the mountain citadel. Then they went into the river and into the barrage. They died in the cool water. More died on the opposite bank, and still more on the walls, the roofs, and in the narrow streets. Door by door, roof by roof, wall by wall, the rebel defenders fell back and upward to the Alcázar. Both sides executed their prisoners and political opponents. For 80 days, the Alcázar withstood bombardment, siege, and dynamiting from tunnels dug beneath it. Then up from Andalusia came the rebel army to rescue the Alcázar garrison. In the river, in doorways, on rooftops and ledges of wall, the dying was repeated. The siege was broken, and it's said that loyalist blood ran out of the little plazas of execution, down the gutters, and into the river. The scars have not gone away. The Alcázar is being rebuilt over the years into a Civil War memorial, lest future generations forget. This generation will never forget. When the siege was at its height, the son of Colonel Moscardo was captured and brought to a telephone in the city. The loyalist commander ordered Moscardo to surrender the Alcázar, else his son would die. 
The father's pleas were in vain, and from this room and over this instrument, the farewells were spoken, and the boy was told to commend his soul to God and die for Spain. He did. The shots heard through the receiver announced execution of the threat. Much of Spain says this was the cost of rescuing the country from communism. Proof is wanting, but so is disproof. It was also the cost of saving Spaniards from themselves and prompted the sternest edict of the Franco regime. No Spaniard shall lay hand upon another. That civil war, resolving such uncertain issues at such frightful cost, has seared the national conscience, left homes and hearts with dark memories and darker vows. It accounts for some of the singular uniqueness of this sometimes noble, frequently inexplicable, not easy to manage Spaniard. Partially sealed off in his own peninsula, removed from 350 years of outside shock and crisis, he is compensated with an unconscious cultivation of his own character and personality. He has developed a particularity. The Spaniard invites you to define him, if you must, as he teeters somewhere between 1588 and 1961. I am very pessimistic about the outlook of people when they think of other countries. In America, most of the ideas about Spain are very limited. In Madrid lives Dr. Julian Marius, writer, teacher, philosopher, with sufficient intellectual power and prestige that he can sometimes exercise a prerogative limited only to the few like him, criticize the regime. But we sought him because he knows his fellow Spaniard, and this is one of the things he told us. The average American believes that Spain is a Latin country, that it is, of course, in the southern part of Europe, that there is sunshine, bullfights, that we had or we still have something to do with the Arabs, that we had a civil war 20 years ago, and that its sequels still prevail. Many Europeans think of the United States on blocks of black and white up to the Alcazar. in bas-relief against the earth and sky of Old Castile. This is one of the ten principal parts of modern Spain. Ten old kingdoms and principalities, steeped in ancient jealousies and hostilities, separated by mountain barriers, languages, customs, and derivation. Held uneasily together by force, by grudging convenience, and the sobering fact that there's nowhere else to go. The Romans, proprietors and city builders of this peninsula, observed that it lay in the shape and texture and color of an oxhide, drying and bleaching in the Iberian sun. And so it hangs, rigidly impaled from southern Europe, neither of nor in Europe, but in proximity, just Spain. In 1588, staking all on a single throw, Spaniards sailed with 3,165 guns on 132 ships to chastise the English upstart. The Armada's wreckage littered the seafloor and channel beaches, washed up as prize of war, the mastery of three continents, Europe and two Americas. Then, north of the Pyrenees, Europe engaged in revolutions, fought, conquered, lost, beheaded kings, founded new empires, and exploded with new ideas and heresies. Wars, some European and some worldwide, thundered and blazed beyond Spain's frontiers. The Spaniard, watched the dissolution of his empire, dreamt of gold and the good life. He borrowed ideas, contemplated new dogmas, joined imported groups and movements, invented some of his own, but played a passive role in Europe. Then, in 1936, 300 years of collected rivalries and old stirring tips, as if prohibition was still present. Americans think of Spain in terms of 1939, I would say in terms of Marxism versus fascism, that you know, it is hard after all to free a country. There have been quite a few changes. Barcelona, the nation's best seaport. A gay blade, contemptuous of Spain's old world shyness, pushing her toward intimacy with such rakish newcomers as foreign investments, industry, mass production and technology. 
trying to turn her head and cause her to forsake her old agrarian hand-hewn economy. The Spanish worker is quick and eager. Last year, some 35,000 were recruited for short-term contracts in West European factories and mines. The government has made a modest beginning in technological education and training. Some economists say Spain would have been better advised to put this investment into basic industries instead of consumer goods. Spain makes about 40,000 cars a year, but only about 2,000 tractors. Barcelona exudes pace and purpose. It seems to know where it's going. When Spain comes clanging and honking into the age of technology, Barcelona will lead the way. Madrid is something else, historically the home of the arrogant Castilian, general manager and self-appointed ruler of Spain. There's an aimlessness in Madrid, a preoccupation with trivia. Without politics, debate, criticism, or free comment, there is little else to do. Pursuit of the good life, of leisure, of the heart. One of Spain's faces, Andalusian fishermen, old as the Phoenicians. One half the yield of a grudging sea for the fishing master, one half for the crew. And days when there is no fishing at all. To the north, in the Basque country, a new face of Spain, mirrored in chrome steel, with a new automated look. The face of Estremadura, the Spanish Southwest, and water flowing toward the eager land. Endless and ageless olive groves, marching off in a million columns to wage the struggle for food, fuel, and fertilizer. Designed face of antiquity, where joy and security have vied with sorrow and despair and made their peace. And the varied aspects of the church. El Greco saw this sol y sombra, the sunlight and shadow and put it to canvas. Toledo's silhouette climbing